This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Hey, how Hello. you doing? I'm good. How are you? Sleepy. Yeah, that's why I sound like this. I just woke I didn't up. sleep last night. I'm not sure why. I did, but I'm still tired. Yeah, I, I got probably 1.25 hours of sleep. Okay, well, I got more than that. I've had random bouts of insomnia ever since the pandemic started, though. So I think it's just part of the whole way my brain is yeah. coping with the depression of I think that's true being isolated from humankind I just um I've never gotten enough sleep in the stretch where I should get the sleep that I need but man do I love a good nap you are a fan of naps is true. I well I didn't really nap in high school because I didn't have time mm-hmm. but napping in college game changer yeah I acquired yeah. I acquired a healthy nap schedule mm-hmm. when I was in college it, I mean, it was like part of my day. It was like just, you know. When I got to college, I, I guess it was freshman year. I had a schedule that let me sleep in until afternoon on Thursdays, I think. As a freshman? Yeah. I should have gone to a book school. I was up at 8 a.m. every day. <laughs> I mean, most days I was, but there was just one day where I didn't have morning classes. Yeah, I wasn't classes. up afternoon on any day. Yeah, I had more. I didn't have any morning classes that day for some reason. Sure. But also, we did have from 8 to 10 every Monday and Thursday class in the evening. 8 to 10 p.m. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> okay. Well, I hate that. Okay. I had a Monday class some semesters, but it was like 5 to 9. Oh, mm-hmm. it was awful. Yeah, the entire college would be in class from 8 to 10 p.m. every Thursday. Seminar. What? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. I'm bamboozled by that. Kate's bamboozled. Um, I'm Chelsea. I'm Katie. Nice to meet you. And I'm bamboozled. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Thank you so much for joining us. We are uh, glad that you're with us. We we have a, a call to action this week. We do. I'm going to be aggressive about it. I want every single one of our lovely listeners, you guys are so awesome in your support. If every single one of you could just tell one of your other teacher friends, just one, one other education person it or somebody. It doesn't have to be a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be whoever cares about education, whoever it is can interested just be in learning. somebody who thinks I'm hilarious. Yeah. So many people. Well, so many people we okay, could well, reach with that. Then everybody line up at once. Uh, so mm. many. So many the people crickets. beating down the, the door to hear Kate's hilarious jokes. Just tell one other person, friend, colleague, parent, peer, kid, whatever. Tell one person about the show. Spread we'll the word. We'll take anyone. Yeah. Come join our ever growing flock of listeners. Flock. <laughs> flock. I Lock. think we should have a murder of a listeners. A murder of listeners. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anyway, just one person. Every yeah, little bit helps. share us, if you don't mind. Spread the good word. Spread the good word. Give us a hoot and holler. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. This week, we are talking about Holocaust education. Yeah. This is kind of a specialty research interest of yours. This is going to be a very a very you-centric episode, because mm-hmm. this is your jam. This is what yeah. you know about and care about, and this is what you do. So, it is. Yeah. I do so a this lot is going to be a, a, probably about an hour of me interrogating you about things. So are you ready I to be interrogated? It. Okay, yeah, cool. bring it on. I'm here so, for it. I think this is a bit of a timely conversation, because our world finds itself confronting questions of how to deal with iconography relating to the Holocaust and other historical oh. events surrounding it. You know, Nazism is once again in our current events, in our news. How annoying is that? Recent protests in, you know, Charlottesville and and the January 6th riots, for example, have brought back symbols of hate that have mm-hmm. grown and changed in meaning over time, but still retain a lot of their power for a lot of people. Yeah. And we've also got, as we've mentioned in the last couple episodes, definitely check out uh, episode 50 on book banning. There's a lot of book banning directed at texts related to the Holocaust and Holocaust education right now. Mm -hmm. So we thought this was a very good time to have this conversation. This is an extremely idealistic and oversimplified way of talking about the problem, I think. But part of the reason 
some of these conversations around hate symbols have become so charged and so ridiculous and so damaging is because we have, in general, we as a society have kind of lost touch yeah. with our history on this particular, uh, you know, event. Uh, it's not one event, series of events, I mm-hmm. guess you would call it. This particular point in history, we've kind of lost touch with the meaning of it, who it impacted and who it continues to impact. Yeah. I think we've lost a really important historical perspective that we need to make sure, especially our young people are introduced to. So for I think, sure. Yeah. So this is kind of my spiel about it. Yeah. I know it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very difficult subject for a lot of people, but we're going to do our best to provide people with tools and resources to have important conversations that are, you know, just becoming more and more necessary right now with what's going on in the world. So do you want to take it away? Do you want to just dive in? Yeah. How can I help you navigate this? Because no, again, this is I... kind of your, uh, this is kind of your specialty so i want to first of all i I want to set the record clear i'm not a holocaust expert i have taken quite a few classes in the holocaust i have done a lot of professional development work on the holocaust but i am not a one-stop shop i am just doing my best with what i've learned to share it i have learned from incredible professor i have learned from some really incredible groups and seminars and you know things like that so i feel very fortunate to have my experiences that i do but i am not an expert so yeah i mean you've been you've been in and around conversations with survivors Mm -hmm. and liberators really leading scholars on this kind Mm -hmm. of stuff so i really do think that you more than most have something to contribute to this conversation well thanks yeah i feel lucky to get to teach about it i feel lucky that my school allows me so much time to teach you know what i mean like i i do feel privileged to have learned from who I've learned from and to attend the things I've done and and to speak with those survivors and liberators and things like that. So very cool opportunities. And I'll get into some of those here shortly. But I think that what you said about book banning and all of that is even more relevant, obviously, not only because of the literal book banning, but also because of the fact that we keep seeing on the news, and I don't want to give it any air to breathe, but people comparing parts of this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. To the persecution of Jews. Yes. Restrictions related to COVID. That has been very eye-opening for me and something that really sort of made me focus to be like, well, we got to keep teaching this and we got to, you know, because we're making ridiculous comparisons. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's it's exhausting to hear those comparisons drawn over and over again. So it's both exhausting and an opportunity to reevaluate how it is we got to the point where we can have people drawing those kinds of Mm -hmm. really absurd comparisons. It makes me ask a lot of questions about how we've gotten to the point where we can have rhetoric like that, that essentially makes light of something so terrible. Yeah. And it makes me, it makes me angry. First of all, I will say that my first response is I just become very mad But then I also try to say, okay, maybe this person doesn't know, historically speaking, all of, you know, I I try to come from it from the place of a teacher, which is, okay, well, let's, let's teach them. They need to learn more and then they will know these comparisons are weak. Yeah. So I try, but it makes me very angry. I know. As a person who cares about (laughs) education, I I, I do feel what you're saying because it's just like, it's very upsetting to Mm, experience this kind of of rhetoric and these symbols it's upsetting to experience all of that and to see that kind of stuff used so flippantly but i agree with you that i think it would be easy to witness that kind of stuff and simply lose hope for where we are and where we've i definitely have to manage that yeah yeah where we've come from but i do the same thing that you do and that's i try i try to confront these things as a teaching and learning opportunity because that's the only way I that's the only way I know how to deal with mm-hmm. this kind of conflict that is just incomprehensible to me. Yeah. My my only way of approaching these sorts of problems is to treat it as an opportunity to explore yeah. new kinds of learning for people who are ill-equipped to know what they are saying when they say that kind yeah. of stuff. So, so I thought maybe the first bit I would talk about is just some general goals to focus on. If you are teaching about the Holocaust or wanting to learn about the Holocaust, what I've put together is mostly a list of resources that I have found to be of great value and that I think offer teachers a lot of support. Mm -hmm. That means uh, lessons and also even professional development because we all need that. The other thing that I want to start with is that I always tell my students this. I love teaching about the Holocaust. It's one of my favorite things to teach about, but I feel like it's hard to be like, I love teaching about the Holocaust, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Like there has to be like that understanding that 
I love to learn and read about the Holocaust because I like to inform people of it. Right. I mean, you have a deep appreciation of history in yes. general. Um, but and this topic specifically. I always get become. snickers from teenagers who are like, uh huh, you think the Holocaust? I'm like, right. okay, it's just something that I deeply, you know. Okay. So, general goals. One, don't give simple answers to really difficult questions. Mm, interesting. It's like, it's one of the hardest things to not do, I will say. And I have to remind myself all the time to not downplay the parts and pieces that created this event. Right. Right. That's really difficult, especially do you, when you think about dealing with teaching teenagers yeah. about really tough human atrocities. How do you, <laughs> I, I stand in awe of your ability mm-hmm. to have those kinds of conversations with teenagers, because I, I will say that even my own experience of learning about this stuff in middle school and high school really don't feel like I did it very meaningfully mm-hmm. at the time. But again, that's not, I'm not trying to just simply lay the blame at the foot of the teachers there. Yeah. It's just that this is a very difficult topic to treat with the level of nuance mm-hmm. that it deserves. Um, two, yeah. do not compare suffering. This is, it's a weird one to think about, but it becomes something that you do really quickly when you read a lot of firsthand you know, accounts or survivor stories, because then you start playing the mind game with yourself of like, oh, well, they only lived through this camp. They were never at Auschwitz. Like, it's a very weird thing. Yeah. And like, so it's, you look at two survivors who experienced two very different things. And in your head, you're like, this person went through more. And it's like, well, I can't quantify I think anyone's that, experiences. I think that our tendency to do that in a lot of ways has to do with the way that we teach history. And I mean, uh, you and I were just listening to a podcast this morning that was talking about this. We tend to teach the that. We tend to teach the facts. Like, oh, this many people at this camp, these, you know, this many deaths, this many whatever. We don't, we, we tend to teach the facts and figures, which... Right obviously lends itself to okay well let's start comparing this Mm -hmm. and this or that location or this person and this person um when you teach facts and figures rather than contexts rather than whys and hows and the impacts you know down the line of what what these events brought into the world when when you teach facts and figures rather than hows and whys it becomes easy to start doing that kind of off-the-cuff comparison i think what you're saying is that kind of comparing can do damage in the long run it can because you don't you don't want to detract from anyone's suffering and it's it's also hard though because you do want to communicate the sheer magnitude of you you want to compare something about how big these you do. events were and what i find myself doing when kids start accidentally comparing suffering i'll start saying okay what were the factors that caused their experiences to be different at what point of the war are they persecuted where are they located all of those types of factors are such a big part of it that those get lost if we're comparing suffering Mm -hmm. three if you're teaching about the holocaust you should focus on teaching individual stories Getting the facts and the figures, like what Chelsea was just talking about, is important, but students can't understand it. I used to teach this whole thing trying to explain how many millions of people, based on each group, the Nazis killed. For reference, we're talking about more than 11 million people killed by the persecution of Nazis. More than 6 million of those are Jews. Over 1.1 million of those were killed at Auschwitz. Our students can't imagine a million of anything. And it's not because... Of any reason other than just, I don't know if I could really, in my head, pick out 11 million or something. Mm -hmm. So then I would try to be like, okay, at that point, this was years ago, the state of Ohio's population was just over 11 million. I was like, okay, so it's just like Ohio being wiped out. And they're like, and so for some of them, they're like, well, that's not that much because there's 49 other states. And it's like, well, you're also, you know, my point, it was not doing anything. It's just this juggling of facts and figures. Exactly. Right. So I've learned that teaching individual stories and then knowing how many millions of people was killed is important, but making it like a reference of Ohio, like most of my kids haven't even been out of the, you know, the area we're in. Mm-hmm. So they can't fathom that many a world people. war that right. would, you know. That would involve that many Exactly. People. Mm-hmm. It just can't. It, they just can't do it. So teaching individual stories is the best thing you can do. Do you think that that's easier to do as an English teacher, which is what you are, versus being a history teacher? No. I think it can be just as easily told through the lens of... Yeah. A history teacher. Yeah, that was kind I of think, a trick question because I, I was asking because I feel like what you have told me about the way that you teach this in your classes mm-hmm. to me makes it more immediately accessible. It makes mm-hmm. stories of the Holocaust more accessible right. to people than I 
ever remembered any of my history classes being. Well, I guess I should say, I do not know history standards to tell you what a history class should look like when teaching the Holocaust. So I'm not going to try to uh, swerve out of my lane. I'm going to stay in my lane. But I'm going to say that my teaching is inspired by the fact that my dad was a middle school history teacher for a large portion of his teaching career. And even though he taught history, he taught it as a reading course. So I know it can be done. Now, I value and I respect that history teachers are telling bigger pieces, right, of World War II. Like, I think that's just naturally part of it. But I don't think that means they're not able to or don't choose to teach individual stories. And there are so many stories worth telling that I don't know why you wouldn't. That's what occurred to me when I wasn't teaching as many individual stories is like, well, why don't I just let them say it? Mm -hmm. I don't need to say it. It's not my voice. We talked about this when you and I went to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. That museum experience is oriented around individual stories in that when you show up, you're given a sort of dossier on a particular Mm -hmm. person. And that dossier has details of that person's life. And as you walk through that museum and see the sort of broader context of the history around World War II, you're also uncovering details about this very this particular individual. Story. Yeah, it's a really powerful way to experience this part of history, not as a textbook full of facts and figures, but as a real living person's story. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So telling teaching individual stories mm-hmm. was that point there. Sorry. Next. Don't show photos or videos just for shock value. Mm -hmm. There are millions of photographs of the Holocaust, especially if you're thinking like the liberation of like Buchenwald and things like that, that are just shocking to see. Even my high schoolers, and I had to learn this the hard way, some of it was too much for them. And it became hard for them because... I don't want to say like they were disassociating, but there was something about seeing some of those really graphic photos and not knowing any of their names, any of their faces. They have no single stories. You and I mean like they were just it's just it's just awful for them to see that. And so you only really want to show pictures or videos of things that further the conversation of experiences. You want to providing context to these images. Yeah. Pretty important. Many of my students were taught at some point the boy in the striped pajamas which is, what is that? I think uh, they would probably classify, I don't even know if it's considered historical fiction, okay. honestly. It's based on, I would say, a high-ranking SS official who works in a camp that seems to appear something about like Auschwitz. Uh-huh. And his son is able to get into this the Nazi officer's camp. son. Yes. Okay. And he makes a friend. Mm. So I have to go through that story and kind of break down like, quite a few things so to this start is a, with. This is a popular text that is often taught Middle alongside school. Holocaust education yes. units. Yes. And it kind of presents some problems. And like in some schools, it has replaced Anne Frank, which is not ideal. So yes. I have to spend okay. my first day kind of being like, how many of you have seen The Boy in the Striped Pajamas? How many of you have read it? Mm-hmm. What's the story? What do we, you know, like I'm trying not to, like I want, I want to believe that there's something valuable to be learned. But I don't think that teaching the Holocaust from the perspective of the child of an SS officer. When you privilege certain perspectives, there's a potential to muddy the waters of the real story. Yeah. And when go. you privilege the perspective of an SS officer in mm-hmm. World War II, that's mm-hmm. obviously going to come mm-hmm. with its own baggage. Yeah. So this book and its movie mm-hmm. are something I have to work through with my students. Mm-hmm. To say, okay, here's what we can trust, here's what we can't trust, here are the parts of the stories that don't really check out. You know, like just historically speaking, like I try to come to it from that perspective because I want kids to read. But in in my case, when I'm trying to make sure that what we're learning is factually accurate, there's just something that it just has to be addressed. Right. So I teach Night mm-hmm. by Elie Wiesel. And he, throughout that story, his his book, I should say, it's his actual lived experience. He went through five of the different types of camps. So he starts at Birkenau, gets taken into Auschwitz, goes to Boone and Gleiwitz and um, Buchenwald. And, of course, everyone knows Auschwitz. So I have to spend a lot of time kind of talking through the boy in the striped pajamas because that camp, as it's described, sort of comes off as being maybe Auschwitz. 
But I show my kids maps and recreations, like the 3D print that the USHMM has used, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, to kind of give them some context for the size of Auschwitz, for the perimeter and the security of Auschwitz. And that kind of helps bring to life this notion that, like, people couldn't just escape. It wasn't something you could get away from. It Which was is something not- that the boy in the striped pajamas suggests... It suggests that it was degree. easy to get into. Right, right. So I have to kind of just work around it and mm-hmm. kind of build in the context to be like, let's just start deconstructing a little bit of what we've learned to make sure it's accurate. Right. You want to allow students to ask you questions and for you not to know the answers. That's one of the best things I've ever done in my entire career on any topic. The willingness to be like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'll look that up. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Just do it. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's a pedagogical point that is very often missed in our educational system i think we don't we don't really set people up to believe that it's okay not to know and i've had uh, i had a parent email me once that they were mad that i um told their student to look something up i'm like do you know what a teacher does (laughs) it's a lot of my day Mm -hmm. oh you don't have the answer should you find it is it a question i've asked you because i need you to find the answer Mm -hmm. i bet i know the answer not all the time obviously but my students have really responded well to writing post-it notes of questions and leaving them. And I'll address as many as I can, like off the top of my head, as accurately as I can, obviously. And then I'll keep them. This year I got stumped. I had a kid ask me if Adolf Hitler had a middle name. I was like, I read this sticky and I was like, huh. <laughs> he doesn't. Interesting. Okay. But I looked it up and they were so tickled the next day that I'd spent time on their one question. Yeah, it shows that you're investing yeah. in them, too. Like, then I wrote their name on the sticky, and I said, oh, hey, Johnny Bobby, whatever, this is your answer. So, um, the last thing, and this is just sort of a historical point worth mentioning. When we talk about, when you talk about the Holocaust, when you read about the Holocaust, it's a capital H event. It is the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a genocide. There are other genocides that are just as important as the Holocaust. I don't want to compare them, like I said not too earlier. But other genocides are not called the Holocaust. So when you talk about the persecution of European Jewry during uh, World War II, that's the Holocaust, capital H. Other genocides are not called Holocaust. That's just something worth mentioning. Because I've had students and other people just be like, oh, the Holocaust in Rwanda. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's just because it's become synonymous because people know the Holocaust is a genocide. So that's just something worth worth mentioning. I've never heard that Mm -hmm. particular error be made. That's interesting. But I think it just goes more to show what we were talking about at the top of the show, and that's that I feel like we've, as a country and as an education system, we've started to fail in our duty to our own history somewhat there. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's a mistake that people make goes to show that we're not doing as much as we could be doing here. Sure. I think. So, okay. so that's just something else worth noting. So what I have now are a list of resources that I love and trust and use in my classroom Mm -hmm. and that I think are worth using for the sake of teaching and for the sake of professional development, if that's what you need. Yeah. So the first one on my list of resources, and I'll include all of these links in the notes so that you can have them all because there's going to be a ton. Uh, The first resource is called the Ogolingle Institute for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights, and it's named after Ogolingle, a survivor of Auschwitz. And she is the author of a book called Five Chimneys, A Woman Survivor's True Story of Auschwitz. It's an incredible book. I've had students read it and love it. Great piece. So Olga was an American immigrant and a philanthropist, and she dedicated herself to this sort of work. So she established this institute. And the institute, it's always called Tolly, just T-O-L-I, because those are the initials. So if you... Got it, got it. If you see people, like, in my uh, teacher groups, they'll call, like, oh, I went to Tolly in whatever year. That's the Olga Lingle. Got it. And so her institute, though, has been used in the United States and Europe, all over the world, and it even goes as far as to not only talk about the Holocaust, but other genocides. So it started in 2006. This is located in New York City, but they have satellite locations and international programs as well. They have funded since 2012 more than 3,000 educators to take part in their grants and their trips and their seminars. They do all kinds of great work and they also provide resources on their website. But they also have taken groups of teachers to Yad Vashem, which Mm -hmm. is a memorial museum that I'll talk about later as well. So they do a little bit of everything for educators, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Next. Another one that I use a lot is called the Candles Holocaust Museum and Education Center, and it is located in Terre Haute, Indiana. I've not been there yet, but it's like very, very high on my list. I was going to say, we're so close. We should just pop over there. I know. Candles is an acronym, and it stands for Children of Auschwitz Nazi Deadly Lab Experiment Survivors. Glad they went with the acronym. So Candles was founded in 1984 by one of the most famous survivors of the Holocaust, and her name was Eva Moses Kaur. And Eva is so famous because she and her twin sister Miriam were Mengele twins, which means that they were at Auschwitz at the same time that the SS officer and doctor, Dr. Joseph Mengele, was there doing the experiments on twins. They incredibly, I don't, I can't even, their story is truly just, it's remarkable, but they survived. Eva ended up moving to Terre Haute, Indiana and starting this. So they do have a permanent exhibit there. The permanent exhibit is called Choices, the Holocaust through Eva's story, which talks about what she went through, but also the work that she and this whole group have done to find more Nazi twin, or sorry, to find more twins of the Nazi experiments. And so they were able to create a list of all of these twins who had been experimented upon that they were able to contact and gather their stories. There are tons of educational resources on their website, on the Candles website. Eva is the author of, I want to say a handful of books, but the most famous of those is called Surviving the Angel of Death, a story of a Mengele twin in Auschwitz. And there's a movie called A7063, which was her prison number. Wow. The movie is... When I talked earlier about not showing intentionally graphic content, I bought the movie because I I really enjoy Eva Moses Core's story so much, but also because her interviews and she's like her spirit was just really incredible. But that movie was too much for my students. Mm. It was much mm-hmm. too heavy. I mm-hmm. really enjoyed watching it. I learned a lot, but would not have probably suggest for a high school audience. If you're a college professor, that would probably be much more appropriate. This is for you, Chelsea, but there is um, a website called thestoryofeva.com, and they have a VR section. Ooh, and what they did was they have created a traveling Eva Moses core wow. that can go places. And even though she's passed a few years ago, you can ask her questions. Huh. And it has the smart technology in it to create an answer Wow! based on thousands of hours of her interviews to answer people's questions it's very interesting it's so cool the other thing worth mentioning about eva that i really enjoy sharing with my students is that she's probably most famous because she forgave the nazis and their their support for what they did to her and it caused quite a stir i I remember talking with you about this because that's she caused quite a stir controversial yes Mm -hmm. and so basically her take was that for me i need to And so I did, because Mm -hmm. she didn't want to live with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But she's definitely up there. My students love watching Eva videos. She had a great sense of humor. And her candles, museum, and website are really great support for teachers as well. So love Eva. Use a lot of her stuff in my class. So the next one is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's located in Washington, D.C. It has so many resources for teachers, and that includes entire unit plans and lesson plans that are available to be used in virtual learning and in-person learning. They have videos and interviews with survivors that you can even set up Zoom calls with the museum to have a survivor broadcasted to your room to speak with. If you are in the greater DC area, they have survivor talks, I believe once a week. Yeah. If it hasn't started back up yet, I'm sure it will soon. Tons and tons of artifacts. Yes. At this place. It's probably one of the bigger artifact storehouses, I would say. Yeah. It's state of the art as far as its archives, Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. The USHMM has a YouTube channel which has hundreds of videos on it that are really great. They have videos on their website as well. I know like at my school, the internet filter will block YouTube sometimes. So if you're allowed to get on YouTube, just freely enjoy it. But if not, their their videos are available on their website. They have access on their website to newspapers and photos and other important sources. What I've done before is I've had my students go in and look for newspaper articles from Ohio during that time and to see what kind of reporting was being done. The kids really like that kind of stuff. And then the USHMM also has a lot 
of professional development opportunities for teachers. So the first thing that it has, it's just called the Belfort National Conference for Educators, and it's their flagship event basically for secondary school educators. I attended this a few years ago, and it was teachers, even as young as I think there were a couple of fifth and sixth grade teachers all the way up through obviously high school. It is now a virtual event, and it's three days, and I'll include the link to sign up for it because they're still accepting that opportunity. It's completely free and you earn 24 hours. That's a lot of time. Professional development. That's a lot of time to earn for free. And it's a great three days. You can listen to historians, authors, there's usually a survivor or two or liberty, you know, something like that. Not only all of those speakers, but also a lot of the education staff and historians from the museum are part of it as well. So if you're looking for kind of an intro into teaching about the Holocaust, I really recommend the Belfort Conference. And this year it's from June 27th to 29th, and it's online. From Belfort then, they have what's called the Museum Teacher Fellowship Program. Right now they are not accepting any new applicants because the 2019 and 2020 classes have not finished their program yet. You have to have attended Belfer, which is the one I just talked about. And this group was established in 1996. And since then, they have had around 430 teachers complete this fellowship. It is incredibly competitive to get into. You'll probably need to apply more than once, if I'm being honest. But it's another extended learning opportunity that gives teachers access to historians and all kinds of other really important resources and learning opportunities. So like I said, it's not currently open right now because of just COVID stuff, but I will post the link that it explains the fellowship program so that if you are interested in doing Belfer and do it this summer, then you could keep an eye on it to open in the future. And the last thing I have for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is that they also have what's called the Holocaust Institute for Teacher Educators, and it's a conference devoted to teachers who work in university and college settings. This year, they're suggesting, just because of COVID again, that if you're interested in this and you work in a college or a university, to go ahead and attend Belfer. But I'll also include the link for that institute for future years when it opens back up, because its, its aim is a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit more specific, obviously, for older students. But still a great opportunity, so you really can't beat it. The next one resource is Yad Vashem. It is the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, and it's located in Jerusalem. Very high on my list. You haven't made it there yet. I have not. Someday. At a conference I attended a couple years ago, this nice guy that I was seated next to, he just kept telling me, like, will you please make sure I don't fall asleep? And I was like, oh, I figured he just, like, flew in, you know what I mean, from somewhere. He was like, oh, I just returned from Yad Vashem. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I'll include their website, Yad Vashem. They have digital collections, access to archives and research, e-learning materials, online courses. They also have the list of the righteous uh, among the nations, which are those who are the helpers. They have info for visiting if you're ever in Jerusalem and have the time. And... From what I could tell from the website and also from the people that I've met who have attended Yad Vashem, it seems that, especially if you're located in the United States, you go to Yad Vashem with another group, if that makes sense. So you're usually traveling with a local Holocaust, you and I mean something like a seminar or something like that, and you go to Yad Vashem. Their website is really great. On the Holocaust Remembrance Day in January, I had my students use a couple of their activities online, and they got paired up with a person who was persecuted and had their photo and their name and what we know about what happened to them. And my kids really liked it. And it gave all 100 some of my kids their own individual person to learn about. So it was really neat because they went to this wall, signed their name, got to find their person. It was just, it was really, really cool. That's neat. So, and that was from Yad Vashem. So like I said, they do have info there for how to visit and how to get tickets and all of that. So last couple. The one thing I wanted to mention is that another word that's used a lot of times for the Holocaust is the Shoah. Shoah is the Hebrew word for catastrophe. A lot of times if you hear Jews specifically talking about the Holocaust, they call it the Shoah. So that's kind of an indicator from when I watch interviews and stuff to know if someone is, you know what I mean? Like what their learning has been or from the angle that they've been learning because they'll call it the Shoah. But it just specifically means the killing of nearly 6 million Jews in Europe by Nazi Germany. It's the collaborators during the Second World War. The word Holocaust comes from Greek. It means sacrifice by fire. So the next group is called the USC Shoah Foundation, and it was founded um, in 1994 by Steven Spielberg. Wow. And his goal was to videotape and preserve interviews with survivors and others who witnessed the Holocaust. Did not know that he did that. That's yeah, I'll include the links here to their eyewitness page and also just their collections page. 
but their visual history archive online has more than 55,000 testimonies, as well as more than 4,000 testimonies that you can just view immediately online. So I will a lot of times assign this website to my students and have them choose if they want to learn about the Holocaust, the Cambodian genocide, the Rwandan, or like against the Tutsis. Let them pick a genocide of their interest or about the Holocaust and then listen to so many different speakers on it. Um, The USC Shoah Foundation and their eyewitness page, they also break it down by the people who were persecuted, the location, and then it also has keywords that you can target. So if you're looking for like a specific town or something like that, you can search that way to find other people who were also from Transylvania or something like that. Hmm. So it's a really incredible website. They have more than 55,000 video testimonies from 65 countries and 43 languages, and it features nearly 2 million personal names from those affected. Very cool. The eyewitness website, which I said I'll link, is also broken down by age, level, exposure for maturity. So it's really friendly for teachers to hop on and find something. And the last one is called Echoes and Reflections. So their mission, this is from their website, I'll include all this as well. It's dedicated to reshaping the way that teachers and students understand, process, and navigate the world through the events of the Holocaust. So if you have attended a professional development or like a conference for English teachers or something like that, you have probably seen Echoes and Reflections. They pop up at all kinds of events. They're partnered with Yad Vashem. They're partnered with the USC Shoah Foundation. They're partnered with the ADL. They send out tons of learning materials, resources, videos, things like that for teachers. Their website is really great and it has a whole section just for teaching. It has ways to partner with them and also just more support for good teaching practices. So I'll include their links as well. But like I said, if you're at like a national conference, especially like for NCTE for English teachers, they always have a booth. They've always got resources that you can take. And their website's really teacher-friendly as well. Cool. So many resources. Oh, my Lord. You just get overwhelmed so quickly. You seem to have an encyclopedia of them in your head. And these are just the most teacher-friendly ones. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of others, of course. I will also include a few other voices that I love to teach, just as good pairings, if you're interested and you are trying to teach about the Holocaust. I obviously have a lot to say about this. I think it's some of the most important learning that we can do. I think it's never wasted time to be learning about or teaching about it. There's just so many incredible things you can be doing with it if you just kind of put yourself out there a little bit. Some of the stuff that I've talked about, like that's professional development that's changed my entire life, Mm -hmm. changed my entire teaching. So it's just, it's really powerful stuff. And I feel a heavy weight on my shoulders in teaching about the Holocaust because I want to do it right. Yeah. It's very tough because you, as a teacher, not like you don't always want to get it right, but gosh, you don't want to mess this one up. Yeah. I think it's also important to communicate that kind of apprehension though, even to your own students in the sense of, hey, this is very these are very difficult conversations. This is a very difficult yeah. history that we have to deal with. We as humans have created this legacy for ourselves. Yeah. And this is something we're going to we've have done to it. deal with forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The fact that we did this. Yeah. And especially when you consider the fact that every few months you'll read about a Nazi that was had been in hiding or had taken a new name. You know, they're still being taken to court for. Like, we're not so far removed from it that it's not still something that you can see happening yeah this is not distant history this is no but in the grand scheme of things very recent yeah oh my gosh yeah we're coming up on what 80 years something like that just about well we're thinking like 1939 to 45 so yeah but the other thing that has made me feel so much anxiety about teaching it is that we are losing these voices yeah that's why so much archival work is being yeah. done to try to record voices record video yeah. podcasts all kinds Interviews, of stuff like that yeah. we're trying um, to collect as much as we can before we can't do that work anymore right and so two summers ago when i attended a conference we got to hear from a woman who was a holocaust survivor because she had been saved by the kinder transport but she was like two or three mm-hmm. so her story was just of what growing up was like as far as the voices of those who were persecuted and taken through camps and stuff, like those are the voices that we don't have as many of. The liberators, the righteous, those are the people that I hate to be that way, but we're losing them. Mm-hmm. And so I feel a great stress in teaching it because it's you're living a part of history that's ending as far as having them here to say it themselves. Yeah. So that's very, like, kind of gets me choked up to talk about. But of the survivors that I've heard speak and of the liberators that I've heard speak, 
I know a handful of them have passed since I saw them. Mm -hmm. And that's been in the last nine years. Right. This is important work and we've got to do it. Yep. Can I just say that the kids respond so well to this learning? That's good to hear. That's very encouraging. They, so many students who don't like to read love to learn about the Holocaust. Hmm. It's very funny because if you know teenagers, you know what a piece of work they can be some days. But like today we were reading night and it's a tough scene that I was reading. And they every single group responded exactly how you think they would. I ended the chapter. They all kind of sat there. They closed their books. And they you could just hear like a... Like there, it was just like all of us were... They were aware of the weight, I guess mm-hmm. is what I would say. Mm-hmm. And if there's something that I don't always trust about teenagers, it's their maturity level. Sure. But I will say that if you approach it in the way that it deserves to be approached they will respond positively. It's good stuff. Good. Yeah. If you want more resources, I have three bookshelves worth. Yeah. I would love to share. If you want to get in touch with Kate, please go ahead and write us. Hello at 16to1.com. If I could have a dream job of teaching people about how to teach the whole class, that's what I do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in any of my resources or great lessons that I have found places, please really do get a hold of me because it's I will gladly send you everything. I love I love sharing it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for letting me do that. Yeah, absolutely. I've been excited about that one for a while. Yeah, we've had this one on the list for quite a while because it's, it's, you know, it's your domain for sure. Yeah, so. I, I spend a lot of my time working with different Holocaust-related groups. And it's a great, I, I hate to say it, it's a great joy, though, for me to be able to do this kind of work. If you live in a place that has survivors, especially um, one way to kind of discern if you think there might be survivors in your area is think about if the airports near you were international in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati had at one point a very large Jewish population because Cincinnati was an international airport and there was a lot of survivors who ended up there. So you may be in an area that has more survivors than you realize. Um, And if you're wondering about ways to have survivors speak to your class or group or whatever, I would probably start by um, contacting local Jewish organizations in the area and just see if, you know, they have any sort of resources for that kind of thing. And then, like I said, there are Zoom options with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on their website. It's cool stuff. Awesome. So. Okay, ready to move on? Yeah. Get to the get heavy. to the wrap-up section? Yeah, it is. It heavy. excites me to talk about, but then I'm like, ugh. Yeah. You know? It's heavy stuff. Heavy yeah. stuff. Yeah, All right. Is. Well, thank you. That's probably... It should be, you know? Yeah. Can I say one more funny oh, thing? Yes, of course. So I've been teaching night every year of my teaching career, and Wiesel died a few years ago, and it was during the summer. And can I tell you how many former and current students I had who emailed me when they heard that? Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that is neat. So they listen. They'll listen. You just got to do it right. That's why I said it's very rewarding stuff. And I also love it because they send me all kinds of stuff to uh, include in my lessons. Mm -hmm. So just by giving a little bit of yourself and anything you teach, you're opening yourself up to a lot more conversations about stuff. I had a student last year send me a couple of videos about Getty Lee from Rush because his he had family members survive the Holocaust. Wow. And this student, a diehard Rush fan, and I love Rush the band as well, they were like, oh, I've got these Getty Lee interviews. I found them on YouTube. I'll send them to you. So I got to teach him. Wow. But it was so cool because Getty Lee is, you know, my kids, some of my kids listen to Rush. Famous, famous band. It's pretty cool. So next week, my kids are going to learn about Getty Lee, which is a great reason for us to listen to Rush all day on Pandora. So pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat stuff. Fill in the blank? Yeah. Is it time? I think it's time. So if you haven't before, this is your chance to make sure that you write in to us at hello at 16 to com and give us the correct answer to our fill in the blank question for this episode's question. And we'll send you a sticker. Yeah. That you can put on your forehead. Yep. Write into us if you've got the right answer. We'll, we'll send everywhere. you a sticker. Probably even if you don't have the right answer, we'll send you a sticker. You know what? We'll just send you a sticker. Yeah, we'll just send Who you cares? a sticker. So do you want to do last episode's question? Sure thing. Okay, last episode. The first Winter Olympics were held in Chamonix, France in 1924 from January 26th to February 4th. There were 16 events with 258 athletes competing. The event drew just over 10,000 spectators. So small. I know. (laughs) The first gold medal in Winter Games history went to a United States athlete who had a stunning victory in the 500 meter speed skating event. That would be the only gold for the U.S. in the first Winter Olympics, with the Americans also capturing silver in hockey and figure skating. And bronze and ski jumping. Yeah. Who won that first winter gold medal? That's so cool. His name was Charles Jutra. Way to go, Charles. Good job, Chuck. 
Hi. Yes, Chuck. This episode. Again, this. write us. Write, write into us. Yeah. We want to say hello. We got stickers. We want to say hi to you all. Please. We'll send us, them. Let us give you... We have so many stickers. I got so Please. many stickers printed. Let us send you all the stickers. All Please right. allow us to send what you What is this sticker? episode's question? This episode's question is this. Irina Sindler was a Polish Catholic humanitarian, social worker, and nurse who served in the Polish underground resistance during World War II in German-occupied Warsaw. Irina's story was discovered by a group of high school students in Kansas with their research culminating in the now famous play called Life in a Jar. How many total children did Irina Sindler and her 10 compatriots save by creating fake documents to make these basically fake lives possible for all of these children who would have been persecuted? So question, how many total children did Irina Sindler and her, and her group save? Wow. Okay. If you have not heard of Life in a Jar or Irina Sindler's story, there's a TED Talk about it. Incredible, incredible support for why we've got to teach about the Holocaust in high school, because her whole story was uncovered as part of a project that was assigned. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. cool stuff. Her, her story is really great. Neat. Okay. What did you learn this week? What did I learn? Probably a lot of things. I'm Care sure share? I learned a lot. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, kind of throw out what we've been doing. We, just like the rest of the world, are deep in our wordles. Okay, we love wordles. I'm a little sad that it's been bought by the New York Times now, because it's probably going to get paywalled at some point. Mm. Very sad. So, we're wordling. Nothing good can stay, but yes, we are wordling for now. We are... You're not going to be able to tell that there's a difference in how I say this, but there's also a version called Worldl. <laughs> world. <laughs> well, Wordle and Worldl. It's the world with lol. Okay. It shows you an outline of a country uh-huh. or it's so hard. And then it tells you how likely you are to get the answer correct based on your first answer, how close you were to it. And if you're not close, it tells you which direction and how many miles away from it you are. I've only gotten a couple right. It's, it's so very hard. hard. It's very difficult. The other one that I'm enjoying right now is called Quirtle. Chelsea hates it. It makes my brain hurt. It is four wordles happening at the same time. Yeah. Doesn't that just sound painful? I mean, Oh, I love it. But every time you submit an answer, it goes for all four. So you have to kind of be working in multiple areas at once, which is why Chelsea hates it. She's got a one track mind. I have, my brain only has one thread, one thread at a time. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. That's what we've been doing. Yeah. I'm just finding all kinds of wordle adjacent games Mm -hmm. to play every morning which now just makes me get out of bed even later than normal because now i have three things to do i like it because i only play the 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 original the og wordle and it's a nice way to start my day and get my brain going yeah well see that's a privilege of yours because if i go to work and i don't have something done do you know how many teenagers i have telling me the any of them several yeah so I have to get it done. So I've mm-hmm. got a chance to survive through my day because so many teachers have their days ruined because they're like, don't tell me the wordle. And some kids like cynic and it's over. And that's the joy of teaching teenagers. True. What'd you learn? I learned. OK, well, one thing to plug first. I learned about it. This game <gasps> called Unpacking. So good. Unpacking is the name of the game. And it's some of the best storytelling. It's a cute little indie indie game title. Some of the best storytelling I've ever seen in a game. It's a very specific mechanic. You are unpacking things out of boxes. You're moving into various locations. And I don't want to give away any of the story, but it's just, it's really neat to tell a story only through stuff that you're unloading out of boxes. And it's it's kind of a chronological progression through this person's life. And you just learn little bits and pieces about their life through the details of what you're seeing come out of the boxes, the moving boxes. Yeah. So very interesting experience, really cool storytelling. And then the thing that I actually learned came on the heels of we've been watching the Gilded Age on HBO. It's a Julian Fellows, the guy who did Downton Abbey. Um, he's doing yes. this now. It's the, we, we've talked about it actually. Yeah, we talked it's about New York it last in the late the 1800s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talked about it on the show last week, I think, or last episode, I think. But what I learned in the episode we watched recently, part of the story is apparently based on the Vanderbilts and the new money flowing everywhere mm-hmm. in the old Dune. money. <laughs> yes, and the old money. All of the money in New York at this time, the Vanderbilts were building a railroad empire. But what we learned, and this was kind of funny because we 
We learned about the concept of short squeezes because of this meme stock thing that happened last year, beginning of last year. GameStop stocks, <laughs> a bunch of Redditors were doing this thing called a short squeeze where they were basically bankrupting a huge hedge fund that had shorted GameStop stock. Anyway, it's a bunch of financial jargon to say that they were betting against GameStop, hoping it would fail because the stock price goes down, those people get rich. So I was like, that scenario played out in an episode of The Gilded Age when Vanderbilt, the guy who's based on Vanderbilt anyway, a bunch of these aldermen for New York City kind of pulled the rug out from under him, swindled him, bet against the stocks, and then he had so much money that he bought all of his own company stocks, so smart. drove up the stock price, and essentially bankrupted all of these aldermen who had stabbed him in the back trying to make a quick buck off of his stock price dropping. So it was kind of like the OG short squeeze. It was very much a GameStop moment, except instead of a bunch of funny Redditors, it was a gajillionaire yeah. Yeah. named Vanderbilt who was executing Over, his own short wasn't squeeze. It railroads? Yeah, like he wanted to build a railways. new. He wants to build a new station, railway station in New York, and the council votes to approve it, and then they rescind that vote. Yeah, and because uh, they're trying to make a buck, right? They want to make money off of him, mm-hmm. and he's like no, 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 not without my consent. And then he yeah. just obliterates all of their fortunes, basically, by diamond handsing this uh, short squeeze oh, moment. So yes. very interesting stuff. Yes. Very, I, I didn't know that short squeezes had been around as a concept <laughs> Historically. in the stock world <laughs> yeah. for that long. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting that I kind of learned alongside of this is that insider trading, as we know it now, just really <laughs> didn't used to be a problem. Yeah. It was just... They were just chatting They casually. were just out in the open. He, he, uh, this guy goes to the, these, like, basically councilmen and is like, oh, hey, you should buy all of my stock yeah. because I'm going to build a new train station. They're like, cool, and we're all going to buy your stock. Yeah, yeah, get it on the ground floor and your stock price uh. will inflate remarkably. And they're like, cool, cool, cool. And I'm like, how are they getting away with this? Because yeah. this is like Martha Stewart 101. You don't get caught doing this stuff. I mean, Martha did. But um, it's true. No, it just wasn't. It wasn't illegal at that time, yeah. apparently. Great show, though. <laughs> yes, very enjoyable show so far. Um, so far, so good. So, can yeah. I say a couple more things? Yes, of Do you course. Mind? No. One more thing. Just recently, we got to see Come From Away live. Ah, I yes. know we have talked about Come From Away on here. Our emotional support musical. If we haven't, we have had to. Um, we saw it in Columbus when they were here traveling so good life Mm -hmm. just it just makes you feel so good it just makes you love people it makes you just have hope and faith and so good Mm -hmm. just yeah anyways so if come from a ways in your area or if you haven't watched it apple tv or yeah apple tv you gotta check it out just oh my gosh make you feel so good that was one thing another thing is that i just want to be honest about something if that's okay talking about the holocaust is not an easy thing to do and I'm sure that Chelsea is going to have to do some real work in the editing because I had to say things a few different ways to make sure that what I was trying to say came out the way that I hoped it would. I'm not perfect. I'm not going to speak about it perfectly. It's something that I obviously am deeply emotionally invested in as well. It's just I want to, you know, do it justice for these people. So don't let that deter you from doing more with it if you can. But also know that it is hard to talk about and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You that doesn't approach make it, it approach it with humility, but you really should approach it. <laughs> I'm sure that when I'm listening back that there will be times that I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I would have, you know, and that's always the case anyways if you record yourself for as long as we have and putting it out there. But especially about something that I'm, I'm deeply committed to. I guess I just want to say I'm sure it's not perfect. I'm still learning and unlearning, and so there's nothing wrong with that. But that just means there's always room to do better. Cool. If you haven't gotten that booster, go get that booster. We're a couple weeks out from our most recent COVID excursion. Very tired. Feeling a lot better, though. Feeling far less nasally than I was. I refuse to listen to that episode. (laughs) Absolutely refuse. For anyone who listened, I'll send you a sticker if you tell me who you are. I'm sorry. We got a little bit of a crunch. We weren't expecting to get sick. Yeah. And then we had to record... And uh-huh. I sounded like I was inflating. So uh-huh. um, if you haven't gotten that booster, though, go get it. I mean, we were very fortunate. I'm sure we talked about that with our bout of COVID, but it's still there. Take care of yourself and take care of others. And it's Black History Month. So make sure that, like always, you're letting those voices be heard and listening to them. I think that's all. You good? I'm tired. Okay. Time to go take a nap. It's feeling very, it's a lot to talk about. It's hard. It's true. It's true. It's good stuff, but it's hard. 
Yep. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah, Difficult thank conversations, you. but we appreciate you hanging in there, and uh, we'll see you next episode. See ya. Bye. Sixteen to one. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at sixteen to one dot com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. And now it chills me to the bone. How do I get you alone? How do I get you?